Beloved of Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving. We confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness. To hear his holy word proclaim, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own and our fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and we repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who we died for us, forgive us all of this past.
And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but with God for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, No, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and at the age to come, eternal life. But many that are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In that reading, we have the young boy or the young man coming to Jesus and calling Jesus good. So I want us to think about us being good. Is there anyone here good at anything? Or going to admit that they're good at anything? Is there anyone here good at those sort of things? What are they? Football. So who, who here plays any of those? You do. Are you good at them? You are. Brilliant. What about that? What is that? things like the football sport we try to do our best to get onto the school football team or the, the local football team we try our best at work to do what we can to make things easier for ourselves and for the ones we work with and we at home we're cooking we try our best to cook some of us succeed more than others and some of us live in town we just nip down to the shop <laughs> microwave dinners are wonderful <laughs> they are, they are, but that's it it's great that we, we try our best to be good. The young man came to Jesus and said, call Jesus good. And Jesus asked, why are you calling me good? He says, there's only one good person. And that's God. God is a good person. But do you think you as individuals, all of us, we live good lives? Do you think you're good? As a person, are you good? All the time? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you think I'm good? Yes. Oh, thank, thank you very much. 
was dreading to say no. <laughs> but how, no matter what we think we are, we can't get to heaven just by being good ourselves. We can only do that by accepting Jesus into our lives. That's how we get eternal life. With God, anything is possible. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. It isn't our goodness, it isn't the good things that we are good at that will get us into heaven. It is our faith in Jesus Christ. We are not good enough, but Jesus is. Let us pray. Father, help us to remember that it is not our goodness that will get us into heaven. It is your, it is your faith, or is our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Having heard those words, let us all of us stand together and confirm our faith, reaffirm our faith in the Almighty Father, our friend, our Redeemer, and our Judge. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, let us say together, I believe in God, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Holy and loving. 
loving God, open our eyes to see you. Open our minds to trust you. Open our hearts to love you, this day and evermore. Amen. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we trust in your mercy and know your love. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the benefits that you have won for us, for all the pains and insults that you have borne for us. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And a prayer for children. Loving God, your Son told his disciples to become like little children. Lead us to work for the welfare and protection of all young people. May we respect their dignity, that they may flourish in life, following the example of the same, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for life events. O God, the strength of my life, make known your world your will for me in this place. Help me to discover friends among strangers, to meet opportunities and challenges eagerly, and to do my daily tasks in your name. Give me strength to overcome my worries and preserve me in your safekeeping. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a prayer at a time of despair. Restless with grief and fear, the abandoned turn to you in every hour of trial. Good Lord, deliver us. O God most holy, God most strong, and whose wisdom is the cross of Christ. Amen. And a prayer for those held in captivity. O Lord God, your Son Jesus Christ suffered and died for us in resurrection. He restores life and peace in all creation. Comfort, we pray, all victims of intolerance and those oppressed by their fellow humans. Remember in your kingdom those who have died. Lead the oppressors towards compassion and give hope to the suffering. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for those who mourn. Gracious God, surround us in all we mourn this day with your continuing compassion. Do not let grief overwhelm your children or turn them against you. When grief seems never ending, take them one step at a time along your road of death and resurrection in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Coming to the close of our prayers, we bring uh, for you in a moment or two of silence our own concerns, worries, and anxieties, and lay them at your throne of grace. Heavenly Father, before the ending of the day, creator of the world, we pray that through the steadfast love will keep your watch upon us when quiet we sleep. From evil dreams defend our sight, from fears and terrors of the night, tread underfoot our dead people, <coughs> that we lose sinful thought. We sum up all our prayers in the words of the grace, as we say together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and evermore. Amen.
history, a well-known hymn. All people that on earth do God. But more importantly, 
especially taking note of what Jesus is telling us about our entry into the kingdom of God. This was a young man who came to Jesus because in Matthew we read, when the young man had heard this, he went away sad. He must have progressed well in life very quickly because not only was a young man, but Luke tells us that he was a certain leader, a certain ruler. This man knew there was something special about Jesus and recognised that the words he was using were of great importance. Otherwise, why would the young man have called Jesus a teacher? A teacher is someone who we learn things. Well, that's the general idea. So it must have come. So he must have came to Jesus, not sure of the question he wanted to answer. The young man, even though he was a ruler, not only ran to Jesus, but fell on his knees and gave due respect to Jesus. Not something that you would ever expect from a ruler of the day. The young man addressed Jesus as good teacher and then goes straight in with the, and asks the question. A question that I think we all need to address personally at some stage. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I want you to notice the question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This man knew that life on, its, on this earth was not the be all and end all. And he was looking for life after this one. And must have been hearing what Jesus was saying. And wanted to be part of what Jesus was offering. He was wanting to know what he could do. Coming from his wealth and the position he held in society. He thought he could do or buy whatever was needed to be part of the eternal life that Jesus was offering. Most unsaved people today think that God will one day add up their good works and if their bad works or and the, bad, and the good works that save their bad works, they will get into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Eternal life cannot be bought. It is a free gift from God because it has already been paid for in full at the time of Jesus' death. The rich young man appeared to be elevating Jesus above any of the fellow leaders in the community by calling him good. Jesus did not deny that he was God, as in God the Son, but with the rich man it did not register and he didn't pursue it. Jesus then asked the man about the keeping of the law of Moses and lists some of the Ten Commandments which God gave on Mount Sinai. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false witness, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Have you noticed something strange? Jesus listed the Ten Commandments that were solely related to dealing with your neighbours and those around you every day, but left one out. The one that was left out was do not covet. He proclaimed that he, the young man proclaimed he had kept all the laws that Jesus said, yet again knowing that the tenth verse or the tenth commandment was missing. He thought that was enough. But as we know, the ten commandments come as a job lot, in that if you break one, you are guilty of breaking them all. This young man loved money, and by all accounts, he would have done whatever he could to get it, and the possessions that that entailed. How else could he have been rich while being so young? His love was money, and that's what motivated him. The next statement that Jesus said, we are told, was that it was given in love. Jesus told him, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. This was a statement declaring, no matter what you have on this earthly life, in the grand scheme of things, it will be of no use. 
when you pass from this world. We have what we need. Yes, some will have a little more than others, but no matter how much we have, the only thing that will be important in our lives is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus loved this man, but that love was not returned, as we are told in verse 22. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The things of this earth were ruling his life. And I wonder if that the same with you. Are you fixated on what you can get and forgetting about those who have very little? Next week is our harvest services. And we can demonstrate in a very small way our help for those in need. Last year we brought food, non perishable food, and I'm asking for that again. I meant to say it in the nice, but I forgot. Bring along, if you can, some non perishable food next Sunday, and then it'll be sent off to the local food bank like last year. We do that to help those who are much less fortunate than we are. It's just a small example of showing our Christian love as a parish. The young man thought he had everything going for him, but the one thing that he loved was holding him back, his one. He came to Jesus looking for eternal life. It was offered to him, but in his stubbornness he, he turned the amazing offer down. I wonder can that be said the same about you? I sincerely hope not. Jesus has given you the opportunity to come to him and to submit to him. I proclaim it very often, if not all the time, from this pulpit. Do you hear it? Do you receive it? Spawn like the young man who walks away? Or do you come to Jesus with open arms, leaving all for him to make the best use of? The disciples were quite perplexed as they were always taught that great wealth was a result of God's blessing. Forgetting the spur of the moment that they were following the Son of God, who had no power to lay his head. He was earthly poor, but was definitely heavenly rich. If we are living as disciples of Christ, that should be us as well. We should be earthly poor and heavenly rich. I wonder, are we? The eye of the needle that Jesus refers to is a very small opening in the door that secures the residence in a city surrounded by a protection wall. It allowed only the person to get through, but nothing else. Those people focused on riches that are like the camel. It had to be left outside, and so will all your riches before entering the kingdom of heaven. Our riches will fall into insignificance compared to what is in store for us in heaven. Now which do you prefer? No matter how much you have or enjoy in life, you can take nothing with you when your time on this earth is over. The disciples then start to question, who then can be saved? Money and wealth in the Old Testament were seen as blessings from God. Now they are not. It seems that the more you have, the more you want. And then money becomes your God and nothing else matters. It was as if salvation was to be brought or could be bought. But as we have already been told, as we have really told the rich, rich man who focused on his wealth, cannot be saved. Jesus said in verse 27, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. After all, he made the earth and everything that is in it. The disciples thought they had given up everything they had to follow this man, Jesus, and were beginning to question what was in it for them. Jesus then missed a series of things that they had given up, which included brothers or sisters, 
mother, father, children feels. But reassures them that they will receive in return over a hundred times with the added bonus of having eternal life. Something that money cannot buy, no matter how much we might have. But it comes with a warning. It is not going to be all plain sailing. Things will be difficult. Jesus even says there will be persecutions. Things will not always be easy. But as Christian people, we are guaranteed our place in heaven where no amount of money will be able to buy our place there. Jesus finishes by saying in verse 31, But many who are first will be last, and last first. Jesus is turning the old order upside down that people thought was important, now it's seen as a, as a hindrance. Even nowadays, church attendance is not a priority in people's lives. Anything that helps others is well down the packing list. Surely you only have to look at the panic buying of things. People were so focused on themselves. But that needs to change for us to be committed Christians. No amount of toilet rolls or baked beans stocked in your house will prevent the Lord coming. It only causes heartache for those in need. We need to walk the way of Christ. Putting others ahead of ourselves and Christ at the head of everything that we do. come to the close of our praise and worship this morning on such a beautiful morning in this beautiful place we are much blessed by our Heavenly Father. As we join together to sing hymn number 605, will you come and follow me? I'm able to pick verse 2, hymn 605, will you come and follow me?
Amen. So we go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.